that make it much cheaper. I mean, you know, get lunch involved. You can get all kinds of things. Come on, that take charge. Who's running this? Go ahead and get started. Um, we have most of our committee here. We are missing um, Lon um, currently, and um, we're missing Justin and Eddie. Um, and if you're curious, I don't know if you can see it back from back there, but we do have proxies for Justin and Eddie up here on the front table. <laughs> they are with their um, kids in San Angelo at a stock show showing pigs. And if you've heard any of their pig raising tales over the last 24 months, um, their representatives up here are probably um, an appropriate thing. So I know they're watching on video. And so um, if we could get a shot of their substitutes, I'm sure they will appreciate that from San Angelo. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. And um, we're going to skip item one about ad identifying our accomplishments. We'll cover that at the end. We have the list from last time. We'll cover that to see if there's anything else anybody thought of. Um, number two is Ebola viral disease recommendations provided by the CDC and prevention and lessons. Um, and Joe, I know um, if you want to give us an update kind of where that is at the national level, and then I can brief up what the disaster committee said they're going to be doing about it. So, Sure. 
So I, I just seen this morning, uh, the National Association of State Admits Officials is putting out an after action report on, on Ebola nationally, on, on what worked and what didn't. I, I think the highlights for, for the EMS community understand is that the information is just not getting down to the people in the trucks. And, and that is a real issue. Uh, most people don't real, even realize that the first draft uh, or the first uh, set of guidance came out on August 26, a full month before the first case in the United States. And people didn't even realize that it, and it was sent out nationally, locally. I mean, it went out, and a lot of people didn't see it. So, th so that's a big issue that the federal people are looking at also, and how do we get the information all the way down to the people in the trucks. Uh, there's all kinds of grant money beginning to come now uh, on, on looking at after action items that are needed. It's, it's all around education. And, and the whole system is switching over to, instead of the Ebola, more to an infectious patient and how you deal with it. And I think it's, it's got to be some re-education. Uh, we, we say scenes, uh, scene safe, gloves on. We need to say it and mean it. And you know, more talking about socializing distance from, social distance from the patient. Don't just go charging in, try to figure out what's going on a little bit as you approach the patient. Keep that five foot, five, six foot distance, that kind of stuff. So um, the, the, the most interesting thing that I heard on a, a call last week was the question was asked of CDC, when will the United States be considered Ebola free? And from CDC's response was it will be when there are zero cases in Africa. And as about a month ago, I, I saw a report that we're still monitoring about 2,000 people at that time in the United States. And that number is probably staying around that number because of people traveling back and forth. So um, from a lessons learned standpoint, uh, you know, I think it was on, on the call I was last week, I was on a call with a CDC, a, a national call. During the Ebola, there was about 13,000 people in the call. Uh, last week, there was 150. So I, I think from an EMS community, we probably have moved on to something new and exciting. But I think the take home message is that we gotta remember that there are some really nasty diseases out there. And we, the charging in days are over. We gotta start being more conscious of what that, and, and that, that is going to be the message as we move forward. All right. And for those that weren't here yesterday, the, the GTAC Disaster Committee um, is also not going to drop this. They're gonna continue pushing forward making recommendations, plans, best practices, doing that type of thing that they do so well. Um, not just on Ebola, but they're really changing their topic heading to be high consequence infectious diseases. Um, it, uh, we are very good here in Texas about zeroing in on a specific problem um, and not really looking at something that would help us in all situations. And so um, it, it, sitting next to one of the individuals who was at ground zero for the Ebola um, problem here in the United States when it when it manifested itself and um, my dish my EMS agency being ground zero for H1N1 even though it turned out not to be anything severe it sure didn't feel that way when it started um, I, I will echo what you said Joe I think I think we have a long way to go um, it, in the H1N1 I was fortunate enough to get connected with the Canadian paramedic chiefs association um, to learn best practices from them about infection control and, and, and PPE and things like that. Um, and the Canadian folks have this down. Um, they practice it every year. It's just part of what they do now. It, and unfortunately, I think the difference between us and the Canadians is that um, when SARS came around, the Canadians lost paramedics. They had paramedics die from SARS. And we've not had anybody die from H1N1. We've not had anybody die from Ebola that was a paramedic doing their job here in the United States. And so um, I, I, I would hope that it doesn't have to come to that for us to get serious and for our field crews to have to get serious. But um, infectious disease is real and, and it's a problem and we do a really poor job of it. Um, just, just reading through and preparing for the Ebola thing and reading about what disinfectant you needed to use and what it needed to be capable of killing and looking at what we were carrying on our ambulance and finding out it was not capable of killing the type of viruses it needed to be able to kill 
and then go in and researching what those viruses cause and find out that uh, one of those viruses causes basically what everybody calls the 24-hour stomach bug or the 24-hour stomach flu. And then researching the number of call-offs that we've had in our agency over the last 12 months for the 24-hour stomach flu and sitting there going, well, 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 what do you know? I wonder if there's some correlation. Um, so it, it, it is a real problem. And so I, I think we, my recommendation for the committee is we continue to monitor and support the disaster committee, work with them however we can as they explore this, um, help them when they start getting into operational issues um, on, on wading through those issues appropriately. But um, it, it, I think the best thing we could do coming out of this is, is that next winter we're not having to tell our guys to remember to put a mask in the pocket of their EMS pants and be ready to put it on and stop six to ten feet shy of a patient to ask them what's going on, that it's, that it's something we've continued to reinforce and it becomes a way of practice for them. Any comment from the committee on anything going on in y'all's district areas? You miss Ebola? Uh, not at all. Okay. Anything from the audience on that? All righty. Thanks, Joe. Um, number three, update on state status of revisions to Chapter 157 rules. Um, the EMS committee met with DSHS in December. We had a pretty good um, audience turnout for that as well um, to start reviewing um, the compilation of possible changes. We started with Chapter 157.11, um, which is the EMS provider rule, and um, spent the entire day um, trying to wade through that and going through what all recommendations had come in, what DSHS said um, they couldn't do because they, weren't, they didn't have the authority to do that, and then what their ideas were for implementing the suggested changes. Um, we, we have a lot more work to do on that, and so we have set um, May 5th and 25th, I believe, as the I next I think that would be days. March, sir. March, pardon me. <laughs> I was just hoping, no, I don't want to be later in the year. Um, March 5th and 25th, um, both days from 10 in the morning until 4 in the afternoon, although we'll probably break a little bit before that just because of airplane flights and, and um, the, ability to, the inability to continue putting cogent thoughts together after that long of reviewing rules. Um, both those meetings will be here in Austin. The agendas are being developed and will be posted as soon as they're approved. Um, they're both going to be in the same location, which is the ITT Technical Building, um, which is over near the DSHS EMS office. It, it is actually Isn't it? right down the road here on 290. Okay, yeah. So, I mean, literally you could walk there from here. Um, and so it's where GTAC met for the strategic planning last time they met in between times. And um, real nice meeting facility, but it's right here on 290. It's close to the airport. It's easy to get to if you're coming into town. Um, that's going to be open to everybody. We're going to start. Um, I don't think we'll touch 157.11 again. We may look at it real quickly in a couple of areas um, where Joe has some questions. But then we're just going to start plowing through the rest of the rules that the EMS committee made recommendations on um, and, and drive through that and see if we can get that knocked out in those two, two meetings. So. Um, this is the first step of many steps, so if you can't make it, please don't, please don't feel like you're going to be left out. This is just giving um, the DSHS staff the guidance they need to take it to legal and start formulating the real language and, the, and, and having the legal folks say, nope, you can't do that, or, or hey, this A should be an and and those type of things that they do so well. So um, anything from you, Joe, on that? Yeah, I would just say that... Um this is this is truly the development of the first draft. So I, I took all the recommendations over the year, worked with the managers, and we put out what I'm considering a draft. And then we came to this committee to fine tune it, and then we'll, that'll be the first real draft that will start circulating statewide and having other meetings to get input. So I just want to reemphasize: if you can't attend these two dates, you're going to have plenty of opportunity to have input into the final document. So, um, and I'm assuming that Dolly will continue to work with this committee like we did with Senate Bill 8 and have some stakeholder meetings around the state. Yeah, the committee's already um, agreed to that, that once we get a real draft draft that's legalese appropriate and everything, then um, we'll do the traveling roadshow again and, and take it around the state like we did on so many other issues. So yeah. it's kind of become our trademark thing to do. So. 
Anything from the audience on 157 and its current status? Anything from the committee on that? March 5th and March 25th are the two dates we have set up. Those are right. All righty. Number four on our agenda is the Air Medical and EMS Committee joint discussion regarding air medical programs that may be engaging non-EMS and non-hospital entities to dial them directly in an emergency, possibly bypassing the 911 system. <sighs> um, so this came up in public comment in the August meeting last year. Some concern of, of some air medical programs who were being contacted um, or setting up arrangements with folks that are in remote work areas um, and the example that was used at the time was the was some of the oil field work um, where they were dialing for the air medical helicopter directly and not dialing the local 911 system and last meeting we discussed it some um, our committee agreed and I think the air medical agree committee is in agreement as well to um, get a work group together um, Joe came up with some great ideas that we kind of need to look at some data on this and determine if it's a real problem or not. So we'll get two or three people from our committee, two or three people from Air Medical to do that. Um, GTAC's going to approve that tomorrow in their meeting, um, hopefully. Um, meanwhile, at our last meeting, it also came up maybe this is something the RACs could assist with. Um, and Eric Epley got up and spoke that he felt it was really more of a GTAC issue and maybe even a legislative issue, depending on if the problem is real or not or how real the problem is. And, um, um, but he did say that he would encourage the other racks and he was gonna go back and do some stuff in his rack. And I don't know if Eric's here or not. Um, yeah, it's way too quiet, he's probably not here. Um, but I guarantee he's watching on the internet too, so my phone's about to blow up. Um, so um, he went back to the air medical provider group at STRAC and um, got all of our air, air medical providers that, that interact in the STRAC region, um, and that's several that operate outside of our region as well as those that are in our region. Um, and they came up with some language for a, for a um, letter of attestation. It's just a tool we use in our rack for a whole number of things. Um, and um, they're all have that back with their legal departments now, making sure that they're comfortable signing it. All it says is that if they enter into written agreements to provide air medical service for non-medical facilities, um, that in there they will, they will have as a stipulation of the person that is requesting them that they have to call 911. And then when they enter into those agreements, the air medical agencies will reach out to the ground providers, not when the emergency occurs, but when the agreement is signed, saying we have an agreement with this company, this is their work site locations, this is the Latin lawn of those locations. This is the, from our estimation, the best way to get there by ground. Um, and um, keep them updated as best they can when those work locations move. So that um, when 911 is dialed, it's not the first time that the ground agency is hearing about that out there. Um, and then the ground agency will, of course, know that the air medical provider is being summoned as well. Um, so um, it's, it's a step. It doesn't really, I mean, there's no, it's not a policing thing. There's no penalty if they don't do it. Um, but it's a good faith thing that our air medical programs wanted to do to show our ground providers that, that um, you know, they wanted to be a part of the team and that they weren't trying to, to sabotage that in any way. So um, that letter's, um, I think Eric would be happy to share that with anybody else that would like to see it. Um, and, and hopefully we'll get the air medical programs to sign it. Anything else come up with this since when we met back in November up in Fort Worth? Anything else from the audience on this? Any other issues with it? All right. Either we've already put them to sleep yeah. or there's just no issues with this. <laughs> Our pigs are kind of quiet, so maybe. Know, uh, Let me check my phone. did say yesterday, <laughs> they, they, it came up that they said that they really didn't have any further issues. By the way, Eric is watching. It has been confirmed. Um, <laughs> So, um, so we'll push forward. Um, I do agree. I think Joe's idea last meeting to, to try to put together data on this and, and to try to define it. I don't think they it, it define it so we can see if it really is a problem or not, um, I think is wise. And so um, unless the committee thinks otherwise, I'll go ahead and, and we'll see what action GTAC takes tomorrow 
But if they approve that word group, then I'll be looking for a, a couple, three volunteers that want to help with that on the ground side. So, yes. Yes, Christine. sitting there so I'll bring that up tonight anyway that so, would be great. Um, I think that's wise uh, a, a lot of times that'll bubble up to the rack if it's a bigger problem than you know just one agency to another which I think could be beneficial that may help get a better feel how big or how wide that issue may be so absolutely and I think Christine raised a good point I think the, the cases that have been brought up that, that I've followed through with and went back and asked and <coughs> talked a lot of those were communication issues. Um, sometimes it was an uh, it was an oversight. It was not meant to do that. And when they went back and looked at the material they used or the agreement they signed, they they realized that that that, it, that impression was given. And so they you know the agencies have backed up and fixed that. So um, so I don't think it's a, a grand conspiracy to take over the world, but I, I do think it's just something we need to continue to try to figure out exactly what it is. So we'll bring that up tonight. By the way. Christine has a bum wing, so that's why she didn't come to the microphone. Not everybody gets, gets to holler out from your seat. We are live on the internet, so. Thank you. You bet, ma'am. Um, all righty. Number five is reviewing um, the rule on leaving patient care reports at hospitals and getting um, outcome data from the patient back from the hospital, the EMS provider. And do we have any updates on that? Is Jennifer Gardner here by any chance today? And here she there comes. There she comes. Good. I forgot to look her up before the meeting. I was hoping she was here. Morning, Chair Committee. I'm Jennifer Gardner. I am the Clinical Informatics Manager from RAC E, Nick Track, the North Central Texas RAC in Arlington, Texas. Um, back in, I guess it was back when I started last March, of, bless you, of 2014, um, we heard a lot of discussion about Rule 157.11. Um, we heard it in the Biotel meetings, our council meetings, our zone meetings. Um, so I recommended that we start a Plan Do Check Act. Um, region-wide performance improvement project. So I called for volunteers from our 19 counties um, and 44 people volunteered. So over the last six months, we've met for two hours, once a month. Um, we've kept visibility open for the state level um, and kept Joseph Schmitter up to date with all of our ongoing uh, progress. And over the last six months, the 44 regional PDCA project partic participants achieved um, a dish's blessing for electronic patient care report handoff. Um, we also proposed enhancements to DISH's custom question surrounding EMS report status. Uh, we standardize a regional EPCR handoff in our EMS plan at NICTRAC. And we also surveyed our TSAE region, um, and I'll show you a, a, an infographic on that. Uh, we called for a regional hospital hub, um, actually we didn't, uh, the participants called for a regional hospital hub EPCR clearinghouse, um, a silo um, for login to access EPCR reports. And we also, um, I submitted our abstract of our PDCA project uh, to HIMSS 15 and it was selected for the Nursing Informatics Symposium on April 12th in Chicago, Illinois. Um, so our poster will go there as well. So what we drilled down into was the DISH's EMS Rule 157.11, Part D, 
Um, if in a response pending status, an abbreviated written report shall be provided at the time the patient is delivered, and a full written or computer generated report shall be delivered to the facility within one business day. Um, so a lot of people got really, it, it, what it appeared was that a lot of people got hung up on that abbreviated written, um, that we needed to go back to paper, that it had to be printed, that it had to be in that physical form. Um, and what DISHES has told us is that the understanding of the rule in addition to um, the white paper and the policy statement produced by the American College of um, Emergency Physicians shows us that it can be delivered in either form, but it must be left before a medic leaves a facility in either written or electronic form. Um, in the Texas EMS Trauma News, the winter version, um, it's all about the patient. There's one page actually focused on Rule 157.11 and that policy statement. The proposed enhancement to the DISHES custom questions, um, if you look at the report there, which you can't see real well up here, but um, it actually shows the historical tracking of EMS report status. Um, the drop-down selections are numerous, um, and this is a DISHES custom question. The drop-down selections are none, complete, incomplete, missing, not applicable, not available, not known, and not recorded. So uh, about seven or eight <coughs> drop-down selections with no definition behind what that selection means. I know in my regional registry I had 111,000 records with none. Um, so what we realized we're trying to bring data forward from our 44 volunteer participants um, in the PDCA project was that not a lot of hospitals are actually tracking exactly what occurs at that handoff. Um, for example, I recommended that uh, the, the DISHES custom question be tightened up a little bit like um, and ask what type of abbreviated EMS patient care report was received at patient handoff and have the drop down selections be a written paper report abbreviated, an electronic report abbreviated, a written paper report completed, electronic report complete, or no paper or electronic report was received or other and then have a question that asks, was that completed EMS patient care report available within one business day as required? Um, I know that there was a pro there was somebody came to the mic and said that we had a problem with this handoff communication in region TSAE. Um, so I know that I would like to look at the data statewide and see who else has that problem. Apparently, it's a nationwide problem or they wouldn't have accepted our abstract on this project. Um, so handoff is, is where a lot of patient error and patient harm occurs. The goal in our NICTRAC EMS plan is for at the time the patient is delivered, verbal communication will occur 100% of the time. A paper shortlist or an electronic shortlist will occur 100% of the time. And the final full care report will be available within one business day. We conducted a survey of TSAE, 76 EMS um, agencies responded, 59 hospitals. We know that over 80% um, of both EMS and hospitals are using electronic patient care reporting or uh, trauma <coughs> e-registries. We know that 77% of EMS have a verbal handoff policy in place and 36% of hospitals have a verbal policy in place. Um, so the infographic walks through the workflow and discusses um, the perceptions of both the EMS and the hospital. Um, for example, the EMS feel that 30% of the time they're leaving a paper shortlist or an e-draft preliminary report. That means they're printing out their EPCR report. But 50% of the hospitals feel that they receive those paper or electronic reports but only close to 10.4% of the hospitals are actually tracking that piece of the workflow. So it's definitely something that we can look for and kind of drill down to to kind of drive that process. Uh, the project participants asked for a regional hospital hub. So what we have done is um, our pilot project with Grapevine Fire Department, um, they use uh, an image trend product called FieldBridge. And they have been, since January of 2014, <laughs> delivering an electronic patient care report to Baylor Grapevine successfully. Um, so we opened up that capability to also Cook County EMS and Sherman Fire Department. And what that's done is that um, their top deliveries are to 32 Nick Track hospitals. 
So those hospitals currently have capability to access those reports. Today, nine of those facilities are actually successfully retrieving electronic patient care reports from the hospital hub. Uh, Richardson Fire Department also has an application program interface. Everybody below that are either um, working on an application program interface or um, are waiting just to make a process change over to Hospital Hub. Because um, it's an education piece, uh, telling the hospital where they can receive those um, EPCR reports. The interesting thing is um, we're challenging the vendors to work with each other. Um, for CareFlight, Aaron Ground, Zoll's working with ImageTrend, IPCR is also working with ImageTrend. Um, as well for Louisville Fire Department, or Zoll's working with ImageTrend to make that interface a reality. And I've had a lot of great work done with Erica Edgerly from ESO to get 23 of our EMS agencies in our region onto um, an application program interface to have the ability to deliver patient care reports to hospitals. Um, our goal is to meet at least 30% of our EMS fire in our region by the end of 2015. It's looking like um, adoption and buy-in and success of the hospital hub, we might meet 30% um, by Q2 of 2015. This is the poster that will go to uh, HIMSS 15 with me on April 12th in Chicago. It shows all of our regional participants, uh, their logos of who made this project possible. Um, and these are people who actually touched that EPCR handoff or the PCR handoff process. Um, so they know the functionality and what needs to occur to make this a reality. And I think the benefit of the hospital hub also, not only is it gonna enhance our relationships and our communications, um, it, opens up, it opens up the availability for one login for the trauma registrars to access those EPCRs in lieu of anywhere from five to 17 multiple logins to access all the different vendor portals. But it also has the capability to provide outcome feedback to EMS. So I think that that was one of the things y'all pushed me on back in November and asked, what about feed come back, you know, what about closing that out, ah, what about closing that feedback outcome <laughs> loop <laughs> to EMS? And we all know how just vital that is, um, not for just patient care alone, but just uh, relationship building and communication um, and being rewarded in their job on a day-to-day -day basis. When I said I think this is a national problem, um, the Office of the National Coordinator has just um, implemented a project that's similar to this, and that is a virtual clipboard. So all those paperwork that we all have to fill out at all the different doctor's offices um, every time we go in there, they've actually launched four work groups and eight project teams to develop a virtual clipboard, so it'll be as easy as getting a Starbucks coffee. Um, or having your phone scanned, or having a card that has all that information on it, so none of us ever have to fill that out again. So moving towards a virtual whiteboard is something that we really need to look at. Um, starting to take a step towards true interoperability and um, true real time to know when we have inbound Ebola patients or inbound level one traumas. That's it. Any questions? Really? I tell you what, I have a couple. Uh -uh. Um, I think you mentioned this, but are you tracking where that? Re so, so if did you say you have agencies that are living leaving either a printed or handwritten report at the hospital when they drop the patient off? Mm -hmm. Are you tracking any of that? Such as where does that go? So we had a lot of discussions. Um, one of the best stories that came out of this project was. Um, how uh, e-faxes went into the bowels of the hospital um, or went into the basement. Um, you know, I think with our hospital hub, we are gonna know where it goes, right? Yeah. Um, we don't have that EMS shooting into a black hole and not really knowing, well, I posted it. Um, it it e-faxed, I got successful confirmation on that. Um, it actually delivers it um, and they know where to go to get it. So it silos it in one location. Um, where we're all talking the same language. And, and actually, Baylor Grapevine has a 60-inch monitor of that virtual whiteboard up. So when those medics are coming in, they can look up to see if that patient came across if, once we move into more real time. Um, some people are, 
are passing those EPCR reports at, at a two to five minute time. Um, some of the vendors can't or are not um, meeting less than a 60 minute time and I do have one vendor holding at six hours. Um, a lot of that region, a lot of that is due to a lot of market forces that are going on right now. Um, a lot of people are moving to more of the health in information exchange, uh, HL7 interoperability. So uh, there's a lot of solutions being sold around those. So um, I think that some of that we're going to have to push these vendors on this process to really get that true time down. Did that answer your question, yeah. Dudley? Yes, ma'am. And then the other one was, <coughs> in your system, who are you allowing, who has access to the hospital hub? Great question. So um, we knew uh, with our workforce at NICTRAC, we knew what kind of workload we could handle implementing a project of this size because we have 178 hospitals um, and close to 200 uh, volunteer, fire, EMS, um, and first responder organizations. So we are allowing two to three people to have access to that. We're starting with the ED director. Um, and we're working with the trauma registrars and trauma coordinators initially. Okay. Any thoughts on hospitalist or intensivist having? Oh, yes, of course. Um, there's even capability uh, down the road. Oh, currently, there's capability to give EMS um, access to that system as well. Okay. How are you guys going to monitor um, the data feedback? Right, back to, good. Back to EMS? Yeah, the beauty in that is that we'll be able to run reports on who is doing who is conducting that feedback um, and the timeliness of that feedback so it, it really I think it's going to launch us forward in a lot of avenues and then last question I have and if anybody from the audience has questions or thoughts please start making your way up um, but uh, the last question I have is that you hear this all the time that well we don't want to leave an incomplete report because you know it's not the complete thing or the medic may go back and change something on it later um, and so I was curious if y'all have enlisted any of um, any legal support it sought any information out there about that it, it, I know I know one of the solutions we're looking at in our rack is the ability to basically print out um, a report at the time we're at the hospital which will not be the complete report the complete will, report will still show up see it's a great idea yeah. <laughs> um, the complete report will still show up when the report is complete but leaving a quote-unquote draft and I was just curious if y'all had sought any legal if that had come up in your conversations and, and had you sought any of the legal gurus up in the DFW area about that no it's a good recommendation we've we've, we've discussed it thoroughly um, Hospital Hub takes a picture of the EPCR as it bridges over into my regional registry. So it's, it's a mirror image inside of our e-track system, um, our emergency preparedness system, right? Our patient tracking system. Um, so that's where the module lives. So as it's updated, um, it's constantly pinging and looking for something new. It actually takes another picture of it as it's updated. So that medic has time, or you know, within 24 hours hopefully, um, to update that. Now I did ask if an addendum would be added, um, and at this point it, it would not. Okay. Um, an addendum would be something that would live in your own EPCR report, um, because it's after the fact, after that, that run is locked. Um, but EKGs are attachments, it's one of the columns on that hospital hub dashboard. Um, and then capnographies show up also inside of vital signs as well. So we're getting the information I believe that we need um, out of the gates. And then there's always room for enhancements. Okay. Anybody from the audience? Mr. Matthews? <clears throat> so I want a, a couple of clarifications. When you say that you're putting the data into a silo, are you intending for that silo to meet the state? Since you, since you prefaced it with the 157M, little m, uh, number nine, that says that we have to leave something, if it goes into a silo, which is analogous to a lot of other products, the hospital would then have to log in to attain that. I've been told on multiple occasions that that does not meet the spirit of that law. Can you clarify that, somebody from the state? So I could speak to you, two hospitals in our region and what they're currently doing. Um, this brings us up to a place where we're all in the same playing field. Um, I think two of the uh, trauma centers that have epic uh, electronic health record within their 
um, system, they're going to have it to where that actually ports right into their system. Right. So it's available immediately as it is. Um, so it's definitely a work in progress. I understand where you're getting from. They still have to go out and log in somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's that's where a lot of people are living right now. Um, they're logging into anywhere from five to 17 or five to 12 different portals. Um, I, I think one person said she had up to 15 to 17 logins. Um, so yes, so that's definitely something to keep our eyes on. So that, so that I guess what you're talking about though would be more of a trauma register that a registrar, excuse me, that was my Texan coming out. No worries. So the, the, the trauma registrar is the one that's going in and looking at these, these data elements, if you will, so that they can complete their uh, trauma register requirements. The, what I'm talking about is the requirement on an EMS provider to leave the document. If, right. So, so my question is, in the, one, in the one instance where you said that there was a screen in the ER, and if you migrate it into the silo and they leave that screen attached to a computer that's logged in all the time, and they can see a new patient care report come up, then I guess that would kind of be the same thing as if I faxed them something. However, if those people don't have that in place and they're having to go out and go to a, a silo, as you termed it, and it's not a HDE, a health data exchange, where it's populating into all scripts or one of the other EMRs uh, out there, then we just need clarification because while that's a smart workaround, I'll give you that, putting a television screen up and saying, there it is, I delivered it, it's on your wall, um, whether they had to log in as long as it populated to the screen, but if they don't have that particular setup and they're having to go to a silo, then to, to look for that, that then, then in reality we left it for them under a trash can on the third street corner, we didn't leave it in their ER. You know, they, it's like a secret agent type thing. They got to go find it. So that's the question is whether or not that meets the spirit of the law with regards to the electronic patient care. A lot of, a lot of facilities don't want paper at all. They have no means for it since they went to the EMR. And I'm, I'm, I'm telling you something you already know it is for all the people that are staring at my back. So anyway. It looks better uh, the other way. Yeah, I appreciate it, Joe. <laughs> Thanks. So, so my question, my, I just want clarification because I don't want people to go down the road to think that they have bridged this gap. Right. And in reality, they're not compliant. Right. So, and, and it's a great point. And it's, it's, it's that sticking point where it's hard for me to even get data on, right? Um, a lot of people aren't even tracking if those e-faxes came in or if they got that printed report or if they, and that's why I think we need to really tighten up that question. Um, and we discussed it yesterday in the trauma registry work group. And I think we're gonna put that off until the next GTAC meeting. Um, we have a lot of changes, right? Coming down the next six months to 12 months. But quite honestly, um, we go back to the point that this is controlled at the local level. This is controlled at the hospital level as well. Um, and if they think that they want them to print out that form, that electronic PCR report, um, in that draft form, um, then, you know, that's, uh, it's a culture change. I mean, it really is. Um, that's what it comes down to. So when I, when we discussed this in the PDCA project, because this was kind of aggressive to go after this in six months, um, I said, it's even aggressive for me. I said, uh, this is a closed solution. This is not transferring discrete data into a registry or into an electronic health record inside of a hospital. That is only gonna come whenever I can get a true health information exchange, an HIE. Some people refer to it as a gateway. It's when you start talking about HL7 and, and the data exchange. Um, that's only gonna come when I get that engine, that HIE behind Regi, my regional registry. Um, so this is a closed solution. Uh, it does get us to one place though. It gets us to one place where we start getting EMS feedback. Uh, we close that loop um, where we can monitor it and track it and see that it's really being performed. Um, and it, it gives us one place and one login where we can get any vendor. Um, I've got a couple of them holding out on me, but I'm working on them. But, uh, and I need y'all support on that too as we grow into this. But I think it's definitely, I mean, do you think it's advancing us? And certainly, please don't take my comments as saying right. that, that I'm being derogatory. You've moved it further in the short time from our last GTAC meeting than we have in three or four years that EPCR has become prevalent. So I applaud that. What I'm talking about is if regulatory comes out and they walk in and they say, Transtar Ambulance, I want you to prove to me right. 
that you met the spirit of 157 M little n, little nine or little M nine that you left a patient care report. Right. So we're we're in the process of using an, an HD or an HIE, mm -hmm. um, and and there's a it's a long process to get all scripts, which is one of our primary hospitals, to receive that data mm -hmm. and populate it somewhere appropriately so that they can see the report. But nonetheless, what I'm concerned with is whether or not because this all came up because we are in this, this significant transition period between electronic patient care reporting and, and the, you know, a message can only be received if the person is listening. You can, you can yell out, you know, the whole tree fall in the forest and no one hears it. So if a, if a facility doesn't want to receive paper and the means that the provider only has is paper, that, you know, in an interim, they're going to do an EPCR, but it's got to go back through their validation process and get to them electronically, whether it goes into the bowels of the hospital or not. Mm -hmm. So the real question is, as she presented it, hypothetically, Fern, Brett, Brett would, do you, you think that that would, in thoughts? fact, cover us? I thought that children's, if in some of the meetings, I believe Children's Dallas, that was one of their questions was, does that meet the spirit of the law? And I thought when we came back to one of the meetings that they said that it being electronically in a hub was acceptable. But my understanding, my understanding was that it came from dishes that that was a acceptable. Thank yes, you, Heidi. But, but I can't remember. I was looking. I didn't see Taylor here. Yeah, but. Brett, okay. Brett, Joe, so, y'all slept? Yeah, yeah. I'll, okay. The intent is to ensure that the hospital has that abbreviated report in any format possible before we leave the facility. Mm -hmm. It, it is all about the patient. It's all about the safe transfer. So we, it says written on the law, on the rule, but we know that written's old time and, and it's going to become electronically. The, the, the uh -huh. answer has to be whatever, in some places it will be written, some places it will be computer, some places it will be something, but we just want to make sure there's something left behind so when I go back in service and another doctor walks in and says, well, what did they do? And here is an abbreviated report. So the bottom answer is any format possible as long as there's something there. If they have to go grab it, as long as they can grab it easily and quickly at the time of transfer, that'll work. If it's written down, that'll work. Um, and, and, and I think, I know the MAC committee, the docs are going to talk about it after this committee also. It's just to make sure that there's information there. Thank you. So, Joe, when a patient's transported to the hospital and the crew gives a report, typically they stand at the triage desk and the nurse opens up her triage documentation program and she's asking questions and she's typing that in. That'd be acceptable. That is acceptable. As long as, as long as there's a written document somebody can grab their hands on before we leave, before the ambulance leaves, and then obviously nothing changed on the full PCR has to be in within 24 hours. But and there's a whole bunch of scenarios. I, I can tell you there are hospitals where I go in as a provider and I type in my report into their computer system. Uh, so, yeah, as long as there's some way that something's left behind before we leave. That, that, that actually makes a lot of sense. <laughs> I know, it's hard to believe, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I do have to say, and I know you don't want to keep dragging this out, I, I got to commend you, Jennifer, and your whole committee. This is a major local, regional, state, and national issue that everyone's wrestling with. You took <coughs> the bull by the horns, you came up with a solution, and it really does come down to the patient. That's and, right. and I want to thank you publicly for doing that. Thanks, Joe. Can yeah. anybody stand up who was in this, involved in this project for the last six months? Heidi, you can stand up. No one, Heidi. No one stand up below. There we oh, go. Here. <clears throat> thank you, guys. You bet. Thank I was going to echo what Joe said as well, and, and thank Rick Antonis and the board of Neck Track for not only allow not only allowing Jennifer to pursue this and beat her head against the center block wall for months at a time, but also <laughs> to allow her to come down here quarterly and update us on their progress and allow us to kind of watch this best practice as it develops. I think that's. That's huge for the rest of the state to be able to watch what they're doing up there. So thanks, guys. Um, next, update on DSHS local project grants and recent changes on the outcomes of the most recent process. Mr. Schmieder. No. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so glad. 
Morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Indra Hernandez. I'm the Contracts Manager with the Office of EMS and Trauma Systems. Just to give you an update of where we're at today, we have uh, submitted a tentative award recommendation, so we're waiting for HHSC to develop their action memo and send it over for the uh, Executive Commissioner's signature at this point. So once this uh, tentative award uh, list has been approved by the action memo, then we will be able to post this tentative award for everyone to view. Um, as far as I know, that we're looking to get this action memo executed by the end of this week. It can take approximately two weeks to get approved, and so we're looking to get this posted by the end of the month tentatively. With that being said, we're also tentatively planning to start the contracts at the beginning of March. And uh, I believe also in the agenda, you uh, have also requested for recent changes on the outcomes of the most recent process. Yes, ma'am. Um, trying to summarize where all the changes have happened, it's, uh, it's best said that we were no longer set as the project manager. And most of you may know uh, Linda Reyes, who has been uh, working with the LPG uh, program for many, many years, um, has done an exceptional job in helping HHSC learn the process along uh, with us, including their rules and their changes as well. Um, with that being said, it, it was a lot of information to distribute to HHSC and to their appointed project manager, so there was a couple of miscommunications and misunderstandings on both ends, and uh, we were able to get through this slowly but surely. Um, I know there's been a lot of concern with uh, a lot of providers and uh, people that have been interested in uh, finding out these results uh, if we're going to be able to execute this on time. That's also been a concern in our department as well. So as soon as this list gets posted tentatively, um, I want I, I want to go ahead and get this out as soon as possible so that we can discuss these options. So if it's people that are on there that think that they may not be able to meet what the contract uh, deadline will be, because we will not be extending the contract deadline, it will still end August 31st. So in looking at that list, if there are any concerns, uh, please contact our office and that way we can uh, uh, go ahead and discuss what it is that we need to do at this point also saying that if you may feel that you're not going to be able to meet the contract deadline. Uh, I've spoken with Jane and Joe and I've gotten their blessing as well. Um, one of the options we'd like to offer is uh, to really consider applying for EFS, the Extraordinary Emergency Fund, um, as an option. I know we've had you guys waiting this long and uh, was, not in our, was not our intention, so we still want to be able to help you guys with uh, your requests if we can so please submit those and if you don't want to wait for the tentative award as well please submit those anyways um, we do have our staff that's ready and waiting and has already been informed that these are going to be priority as well as the LPG and which is why we've had uh, three of our girls here who have been working on this as uh, diligent as possible to help out HHSC with any of the questions they may have in regards to the LPG program um, I am happy to report that the FY16 LPG will be posted tentatively April 1st, so we are back on track and have learned from many of the mistakes in a lot of this delay process with FY15, so we were able to work hand in hand with the new assigned project manager to the FY16 program, and I'm happy to report that we will be able to post that on time and we are uh, looking very positively to stay on track for next uh, next uh, LPG program. And I will take any questions. One question I had is that several months ago the committee discussed this over a couple of meetings about some of the funding levels being old and not funding the equipment that people are looking for today, injury prevention equipment and things like that. And so I was just curious because I know there was a lot of work done in resetting that and cleaning that up some is, did, did y'all see any impact on that as far as number of awards capable, money running out faster, those type of things like that? Was the number of applications and the number of awards similar in a percentage as it has been or has that changed? Uh, I'm limited to what I can talk about until this gets posted tentatively, but uh, to give you an overview, um, changing the price listings and uh, the changes that were made, we did see some impact. It wasn't a major impact, but we did see some impact. There were um, 
uh, a lot of new requests, I will say that, and a lot of interesting requests as we read through some of them. So um, to say the least, uh, there was some changes, and I think they were positive changes. I think we were able to uh, award uh, some of the projects that we probably wouldn't have considered otherwise without okay. those changes. Cool. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay. Go ahead, Wanda. What if someone is not able to um, meet that deadline given the delay in the process? If they're not able to meet the deadline, uh, the August 31st contract uh, deadline on that, um, I'm going to highly recommend that they consider not taking the contract. And that's where we're offering the op option of looking into an EIF. It won't necessarily restart it. Uh, we'll actually have the option to amend it. So it may cause about a week or two delay to make this amendment if we have to change this tentative award list, which is why with the uh, new process, we're able to have a tentative award and then a final award posting. So we've allotted about 10 to 15 business days to make any changes from the tentative list. Remind me, please, how much was available through the local project grant? Uh, 1.3 million. And do you anticipate awarding all of that? Yes, sir. And if somebody backs out, I think I heard you say, mm -hmm. if somebody backs out, can't do it, will the unsuccessful applicants be reevaluated? Um, That's what we're looking at. Uh, so the next uh, next person that, or you know, next group that was <coughs> possibly going to be the next awardee, will go in that ranking in the scoring ranking. We were able to score all the applicants and highest to lowest, so we'd go in the next lower step after uh, the people that were awarded. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Indra, thank you so much for the update. We look uh, forward to the tentative award. Thank you so much, and uh, please do not hesitate to give us a call. Like I said, we are po looking to post for FY16 in uh, April 1st, uh, possibly a little earlier, but do not hesitate to give us a call if you have any questions in the meantime. All right, next on our agenda, um, is item number seven regarding the interstate recognition, cooperation, and accountability of EMS personnel working across state boundaries. Consider the model legislation document entitled Recognition of EMS Personnel Licensure Compact or Replica that is posted on the National Association of State EMS Officials website. Um, this is actually um, a document that the National State EMS Officials have been working on for the last two and a half years um, to provide some model legislation for states to enact that will institute a interstate compact, much like the nurses' interstate compact, and, and I think physicians have one um, that will allow certain that will allow states to do things amongst themselves um, and handle a bunch of background issues. So on the EMS one, um, I think I'm going to look this up so I get it right. Um, a state that authorizes this and passes the legislation to put it into place. Um, and, and meets the following requirements. Um, currently requires the use of national registry exam as a condition of issuing initial licenses at the EMT and paramedic level. Has a mechanism in place for receiving and investigating complaints. I think we have that here. Notifies the commission um, in compliance with the terms herein of any adverse action or significant investigatory information regarding an individual. No later than five years after activation of the compact requires a criminal history check, which we already do, and complies with the rules of the commission, which haven't been written yet. Um, then what it allows to happen um, is it allows individuals that cross over state lines, if, they, if they're going from their home state to what the compact calls a remote state, um, to do things much cleaner than it is done today um, and, and solves a lot of the issues that can come up today. So. Um, what this basically the conditions of practice say that an individual may practice in a remote state under the terms of the compact in the following circumstances if the individual originates a patient transport in their home state and transports the patient into a remote state or the individual originates in the home state and enters a remote state to pick up a patient and provide care and transport and transports the patient to their home state or the, the individual originates in their home state, enters a remote state to provide patient care and transport within that remote state, or the individual enters a remote state to pick up a patient and provide care and transport to a third member state. Um, so basically what it allows to happen is, is, is folks to cross back and forth across state borders 
um, continue to practice underneath their own home state, their own medical director, but it gives the remote state some avenues to take action. So if, if that person from their home state came into Texas and and did something inappropriate during and that was turned into a complaint and DSHS looked into it DSHS would actually have the authority to say that paramedic cannot operate in the state anymore those type of things share that information of what they found back with their home state Texas cannot take away or the 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 remote state cannot take away or hinder that person's ability to practice in their home state However, they can share the information on what has occurred in the remote state back with their home state in case it's egregious. Um, and then one of the things that I found really that I think would be beneficial about it is that the states that are a part of this compact can share that information readily so that if I live in, say, Alabama, and Alabama's a member and, and Texas is a member, and I get my license suspended or put on probation and I come toodaloo into Texas, um, that it allows that free and open information sharing between Alabama and Texas so that I can't try to run from my problems. Um, so I think it could have other issues out there. Anyway, so this, this came up. It was released at the end of 14, I believe. Yes, sir. And um, um, it requires legislation um, to enact it. Um, several states are looking at it already. Um, there are some groups here in Texas that um, are having this model legislation transformed into Texas, Texas speak. Um, and there is some interest potentially, from what I understand, um, to see this get introduced um, and, and some folks in the legislature interested in introducing this. So we want to bring it forward. I know the medical directors, Dr. Beeson is going to bring it to the medical directors to discuss, but wanted to um, give maybe Joe a little bit to introduce and, and fix all the errors I made in introducing it. And then um, anybody that would have some questions about how it would work and the benefits of doing it, uh, a time to ask those questions. I will say, Chairman, you did an excellent job on explaining it. Well, I read so the I document. I have no corrections <laughs> to what you said. The only, there is one advantage to being one of the first 10 states. Um, the, ten, the first 10 states uh, will actually make up that board that sets the rules for the compact. So. There are 10 states nationally in some stage of passing or developing by which to pass this compact. Okay. I think Dr. Beeson may have wanted to say something. No, I'm just going to actually bring up what Jeff said, Jeff Beeson, um, that the um, NASIMSO obviously introduced the thing, National Association of EMS Physicians and other groups have obviously endorsed it, as many of the reasons you talked about, plus the fact that being able to get other medics in other states easier to come and gain employment in the Texas as an EMS operator. Um, <clears throat> the state, I mean, the nurses, we've had a replica or a, um, a um, interstate compact for, uh, see, I've had mine for 10, 12 years probably. Um, physicians actually have legislation, can I have some? Um, legislation that's been introduced this year. So I think uh, there's already discussions going on with the benefits of, a, of a, an interstate compact. I think it would be very beneficial for us to get it going now. Um, as Joe said, the first 10 states that are once 10 states get this, the group will sit down and write the rules of how this is going to work. Um, if we don't get it done this year, if, if DISH just decides to do it, it'll be a multi-year process to drive it. Um, if we don't get it done this year, then another two years, it'll be up and going and we won't get a seat at the table. We'll be sitting behind the table and listening to everybody else discuss it. So I, I'm not a politician and I don't really know how all this works, but I really think there's enough people in the room and this is such an important thing for EMS in general that, that we start calling um, and we somehow, the, the, you said the legislation is being rewritten in Texas wording. The sample legislation exists on the website. Um, it, all the information to call your local representatives, your senators, whoever it is. Um, but with the physician compact being um, introduced, I think now is the time to really get this moving in Texas. Absolutely. Any questions, comments? I've kind of been making a little fun of Justin. I really wish he was here. If you talk to folks that live on or near the border with any of our neighboring states, um, there are issues just with the day-to-day -day crossing back and forth, um, either to transport patients, to provide mutual aid, stuff that is in times of disaster a lot of times is covered 
um, in a statewide disaster like a hurricane or that type of thing, but um, a large bus crash near the border where you're going to have multiple units and personnel out of multiple states there it, that's never going to reach state status, is never going to involve the current in place emergency management interstate compact. Um, this cleans that up remarkably well um, and really, I think, provides DSHS some power that, that they currently don't, I don't want to use the word power, gives them some rights they currently don't have with folks that are coming across that state line. Um, also protects our personnel when, when they cross over that state line to provide that same type of assistance, um, knowing that, that, um, that um, they're going to they're gonna have a, a place to come back to and defend themselves here in this state. It, there's just a lot of things that I think this cleans up really well. And I think a lot of the issues we hear people along our border with the other states have, um, this will help alleviate a number of those as it, as it grows. And, 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 and I will echo what Dr. Beeson said. I would much rather get this done sooner rather than later. Anything from the table? Anything from the room? Anybody, any qualms, concerns, questions? Yes, yes, Shirley. Absolutely. We're hoping it'll we're hoping that it'll help with that issue. Um, as well as the reciprocity issue that Dr. Beeson mentioned as well long term. So um, again, those are things that I think we'll be able to, to help drive if, if we get this done. So um, anyway, more to come on that. Those of you who watch the legislative activity and you see that come up, please do what you feel compelled to do um, to support that if you would. What's the time frame on that, Joe? What do you mean by the time frame? How long is it going to take to get through legislation to do the whole deal? If it happens in Texas, You're it'll be a done Pennsylvania by June. Pennsylvania boy on how things work <laughs> in Texas legislation. <laughs> the bill has to be filed by March 15th. The yeah. bill has to be filed on March 15th. It Everything has to be done, and it has to be signed by the first part of the summer. That's us, and then they'll they'll start working on it as soon as 10 states get it yes, done. Yes, sir. So we may be one of eight to get it done between now and December and we're just going to hang around until the ninth and 10th one get it done and then they'll convene the rulemaking body to start saying okay here's the real real meat on the skeleton to to actually make the thing work I, I do know if it doesn't make it through this session then obviously it's two years before yeah. it come up again in our state <laughs> yes sir all righty um, I'm going to real quick go to the – Sam, I'm going to skip over you for just a minute. Can we get the update from the Trauma Registry Work Group? And is Chris here to talk about the registry? Could we combine that those two items real quick? Chris, if you want to come up, and I'll have Brian start. Actually, that's what I was going to ask if we could – You was going to introduce because, Chris? Because the Texas <laughs> Data High Sheriff and his posse are here, and they've got some really good <laughs> things to tell us. The High Sheriff and his posse. <laughs> High data sheriff. High data sheriff. Awesome. Uh, correct. <laughs> you like that? You like that? Uh, correct. <laughs> Hello, everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, Mr. Chair, we have put together just a, a quick PowerPoint, uh, just a few slides, just to begin conversation on, uh, on a new topic. Uh, our epidemiologist right here, Dr. Patel, will just go through um, those slides. Good morning. Good morning. First of all, I would, I would like to thank everybody whoever is uh, submitting data to the registry. Uh, because of the data, that we can do a lot of work. Uh, trauma, EMS and trauma registry is uh, actually a passive surveillance system. And the CDC has identified some key attributes for any effective surveillance system. And these are the listed uh, uh, attributes right there. Of these, usefulness, sensitivity, timeliness, and stability are the most critical to the success of the surveillance system. Simplicity, acceptability, and flexibility will affect establishment and susten sustainability of the surveillance system. Data quality, positive predictive value, and representativeness are the central to accurately characterizing health-related events under surveillance. Now, 
when we talk about data quality, which is our focus today, there are two aspects, major aspects. One of them is the completeness of records, and the other one is uh, data accuracy. Now, so far, we have pretty much more than 2.6 million records in EMS in 2013. So we have enough data over the period of time. We have enough data coming in and, and in a timely fashion. But completeness is one of the key here. So talking about data validity, we look at a few examples here, a few data elements. One of them is a call type. In call type, as we look on the left of um, pipe, we have 50% of the records uh, with uh, medical and about 13% trauma and uh, about 2% uh, medical trauma. Along with this, we have not applicable and not recorded. Now, when we talk about data validity, those not applicable and not recorded are considered as valid null because they are valid choices for people to uh, provide the data but because they are not providing the information that can be analyzed for a particular uh, issue. So their call is valid null. And the information here that is missing in those records is called as uh, null. So overall, when we look at the pie on the right side, we have about 65% of records with valid information in there that can be analyzed and uh, inferences can be made for a particular issue. But 35% of re uh, records that we have uh, valid null, that means uh, we have uh, information that is uh, not recorded, not applicable, and, and we have about 23%. So in this case, we have almost 0% uh, that is null. That is, we don't have any missing information in there. So the challenge is to get the, all the medical records as much as possible with complete information that can help us in analysis and providing the uh, information that people, particularly people who are in research or people who are in planning that they are looking for. When we look at another example here, which is cause of injury, here we have about 49% of records with uh, valid information in there, but 41% of records that has missing about cause of injury. Now, this is the, these are the records that we look selected only for trauma only. Uh, even in there, if we don't have cause of injury, that is E code, uh, the information is not helpful. Now, we selected another example here, uh, and we tried to calculate the response time, scene time, and transport time. For this, to calculate this time intervals, we need the PSAP call time, that is the EMS unit notify time. EMS unit arrived at the scene time, uh, EMS unit left the scene time, and patient arrived at the destination time. So all of these records, when we look at the intervals uh, calculated, uh, for response time, we have 38% of records that has missing information. And we have about 30% of records that has missing information for scene time, and about 27% of records that is missing information for transport time. In short, basically, uh, we need to put more efforts in providing as much as uh, complete information on each record so that the data can be utilized properly. So at the end, data completeness and data accuracy are essential elements for any surveillance system. Uh, injury program is actually belongs to you all, uh, and people who submit the data, they keep the registry active and alive. Not to provide complete and accurate data is a missed opportunity for contributing in the improvement of public health. So integrated approach is important for any program to perform at its best, and for that reason, uh, stakeholders are very important. And that's the reason the program here is talking about bringing the challenge to the group and uh, see how we can improve our best uh, to get the best data out and then provide the inferences uh, that people want to know. Thank you. Thank you, Prakash. Um, in a sentence, the past we've been worried about getting the data into the registry. We're doing that now. 
Now we need to start taking a look at what type of data is coming in. And so we're noticing that um, there's large proportions of data that's coming in to the registry uh, with values selected as not applicable, unknown, which in instances, those can be the appropriate uh, and correct responses. Um, but we, we, there's no way for us to determine if 100% of all these unknowns and not applicables are the appropriate responses. And so we started to take a look at all of the data arms to see where um, there may be uh, issues in quality of the data coming in. So this was just a quick example looking at uh, one data element. Now, moving on with that, one way that we can overcome uh, these issues with quality is when we transition to NEMSIS uh, V3 data. Just to give a quick update to uh, committee members, um, as of right now, our vendor has completed the processes in which um, was required before NEMSIS could come and test our system. And so um, right now we're waiting for NEMSIS to come uh, to test our system. If everything tests out perfectly fine and everything, we are now uh, we'll be get that certified stamp and we'll be uh, able to collect um, NEMSIS V3 data and actually submit data up nationally. That process, uh, there is some time with that process uh, for certification. Uh, what I'm hearing is four to six weeks. So if everything is looking good on our end um, and if there's no uh, issues in the testing phase from NEMSIS um, at the earliest, we'll be able to, um, we'll, we'll, we could say that we're certified with NEMSIS approval, it wouldn't be until April, but that's, once again, that's at the earliest. I got a couple more items that I just wanted to bring up. Well, going back to this NEMSIS, the data will come in following the schematron from the national organization. So if the data comes into us from the vendors, um, it has to pass these rules. Um, it comes to us, it has to pass through the same set of rules, and then when we submit the data up nationally, it passes through the same set of rules. Now, these rules will help overcome some of these limitations that we have in the data coming in right now, uh, such as missing data. Um, through the process, it will, um, the rules will have it that it will show a value um, has been uh, not entered. And so there's gonna be some changes from those who submit data. Uh, from the EMS providers, from the uh, third party services, when we transition to this new NEMSIS standard. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, right now, the system, if a blank is submitted, uh, as Prakash showed, we do have missing data in the registry. Um, but that process may change as we switch over to um, this NEMSIS standard. Some other things that I'll just like to mention today. Um, first, uh, DSHS uh, has, is working with TTAF in developing the first ever EMS data management course. Um, this course is scheduled for May 7th here at the Crown Plaza in Austin, Texas. Um, there are flyers outside that TTAF has provided, so please pick one up as you um, exit the meeting. Uh, the target audience are team members responsible for abstracting and submitting data to the Texas EMS and Trauma Registry System. Um, there's going to be a focus on the NEMSIS system and in the data dictionaries. Um, there's a couple of featured speakers, including Karin Jacobson, who is the technical director for NEMSIS. Um, Dr. Fowler is also going to be a speaker. Um, Preston Love and Kevin Doramis have been also identified as, as uh, presenters at this data management course. Uh, more information will come out, uh, so um, be on the lookout on TTAS website as they uh, continue moving forward. Uh, with this inaugural EMS data management course. Um, one other thing that I would like to bring up, um, Mr. Chair, we talked earlier about um, Chapter 157 and rural vision process. Um, I would like to uh, mention at this time to the committee, I know discussions are, cannot occur at this time, but uh, we began looking at Chapter 103 um, and how it relates back to the EMS community is Section 103.5 which is the reporting requirements for EMS. Uh, and so we'll like to uh, begin discussion uh, on that chapter as well. Um, if you remember 103.5, uh, the reporting requirements for EMS, it states um, all, all runs are to be reported to the registry. Um, so it's not as in-depth technical as 157 in the EMS committee, but I would like to bring that up for a future discussion at GTEC meeting. 
Any any questions at this time? Because that concludes our report. Go ahead. So uh, I had occasion to try to get data from trauma registry in the last couple of weeks. And um, from an EMS provider's perspective, if I can't get data out or I have to email folks to get data run, um, I don't really care what data is there. So data validity doesn't matter to me. Um, we've got to, we've, we've saw this with stroke, we saw this with STEMI, we saw it with trauma on a local level, that if we can get feedback back to folks in a timely manner, then they're more interested in doing it. So if you're looking at 2013 data, it might as well be 2003 in terms of timeliness to get it back to me. If I can't go on and run reports about what my call looks like, if I can't even get information back on whether my reports are submitted valid, valid or not, because I go through STRAC instead of submitting it myself, um, then it's just a black hole to me. It's not useful for me on the operational level. Where are we at as far as making that useful for the providers? The presentation today was representative of 2013 data because that is the latest data set that is finalized, um, meaning that uh, it's available for public use. Um, we could have easily done this presentation with 2014, including 2015 data. Um, in regards to validity, we are working on the uh, validity process module uh, to have that up and running within Maven. So um, any user of the registry, um, your EMS providers will be able to uh, run a validity report on their own data. Um, and they could specify the time frame of data that they want to run it for. Um, and they can get their own feedback as to the quality of data that they're submitting to the registry. Um, if you want a little bit more detail, I have our project manager, Rap Klein, um, who can speak a little bit more on that. <laughs> <laughs> he just left. He told you he brought his posse. Did you, did you want some additional information on that? or? Uh, uh, well, so, what, what's broken to me is that I can't find out what my service is doing and how my service compares to the rest of the services in the state. Um, that, because that it, I can't even find out if there's data in there on me. So if they have any updates on that, that would be greatly appreciated. Yes. Okay. The, two, the one thing that uh, Chris has just mentioned, uh, we have these data validity reports. Basically, it tells you uh, how many records were submitted by your entity, uh, which uh, records uh, came in as uh, a valid or a valid no, and which uh, uh, questions that were answered are blank were not answered at all. So these are kind of just overall reports that will give you a uh, total number of records and where they fall into so you can get a kind of an accuracy of how well the, the whole uh, record process is being filled out. So that's kind of week, just an overview. As of a week ago, that wasn't running, correct? Correct. It's, we're still working through that process right now. Should we expect that by our next meeting in May? Yes, you will have that by next meeting in May. Okay. In fact, sooner than that. But uh, I don't have an end date at this point. In time. Okay. Uh, the other key thing is, uh, as part of our uh, 2000 calendar year 15 project, we are working towards uh, providing entities their own extract of their information. So we are going to provide them with whatever information they put in. We'll give them in some type of mm. uh, file format that to be still de determined. We're working with our vendors, so each of the of the people that have entered data can actually get their data out on a per year or we're trying to work out the arrangements of that so they can actually take a look at their data and do their own analysis if they want. Uh, right now the epidemiologist Chris's group also offers that service too so if there's a question you want answered or something you want to take a look within your data they also offer that if you uh, give them a call they will also take a look at the data and, and try to answer the questions you're trying to find out. Correct, Rob. Um, our program, if a data request is made to our program, um, we have two avenues in which uh, we like our customers to contact us. One is via our 1-800 number on our website. The other is through our injury.web at dshs.state.tx.us email account. That email account is checked periodically throughout the day. I have my staff back here. Um, every day that account is cleared. There won't be any emails left in there untouched. It goes into our tracker system. Any data requests goes directly to our epidemiologist. We then contact whoever submits the request to find out more information. One, the, what is it that you're really looking for? And two, if that can be answered with the trauma registry. 
and then return around these data requests within 10 business days. So if a provider is interested in seeing how they're doing compared to what the rest of the state is doing, that is a data request that we can fulfill. And so if they follow this avenue, they'll be able to get that data. One of the questions they're going to ask you is what time point do you want? Are you looking for 2015 data, 14 data, 13, 11, 10, 12, if I want to keep that in order? Um, so there's a lot of questions to fulfilling these data requests. So this is why we have this process in place. Um, so have them just contact us and we'll be able to work with them. Chris, I've got just two questions real quick. One, I, I want to commend you guys. You're doing a great job tr with, with a difficult project. Um, it's refreshing to look out and see the posse you brought with me, with, with you, because for years we would look out there and there was one to two people in epidemiology and that was it, and that was a revolving door. And now it seems like you guys got some stability. And, and, and that's good for us, because I think that we're going to be able to get better information now and better understanding of what you're doing. Correct. We have currently on staff four epidemiologists uh, with uh, masters and PhDs. Um, our newest epidemiologist actually has an infectious disease background. So every time someone mentions something about infectious disease epidemiology, her ears perk up in the back. Um, if you talk positive or negatively, her ears still perk up in the back. Um, and our registry operations support team has currently four members on it who are answering your calls and filling all the requests. And so I give credit where credit's due. It's, it's, I'm in charge of the program, but these guys are the ones who do the work. So we appreciate that comment. One other thing I want to mention to this committee, um, tomorrow's presentation by our, uh, by our division, um, there's gonna be an infographic in which, unfortunately, I should have brought it here to present it here. But it talks about the timeliness of the data that's coming to the registry. And it goes from 2007 all the way to 2013. And the reason why it stops at 2013 is because that's the last year we, we finalized. But I looked at the data for 14 and it holds true. When we switched to the current uh, registry application system, the median days in which an EMS provider, a call is made and the record is reported to the registry is below that 90 day rule. It's been like that ever since this new EMS trauma registry has been in place. Prior to that, it, uh, the median time has always been greater than a 90 day rule. And so I just want to thank the EMS co committee and the community at large for um, working with us and getting the data to us because the data is showing that it's coming to us in a more timely fashion. And so I felt it was appropriate to, to make that mention here in this committee. Uh, two last questions for you. One, with, uh, with the Nemesis 3, version 3, will we, do you think that with the introduction of the Schematron and with, with that, all the different the questions and the way we have to answer the questions, do you think we'll get better data back? Do you think that that 40% that we're talking about will go away? Or do you think we're still going to have the bad data problems and we need to try to do something on our end? I, I honestly believe the Schematron will really help immensely. Uh, we're looking at it where uh, if you want to submit records, that has to be completed, the data. Mm -hmm. And if it's not going to be completed, we can actually pinpoint where it's not coming in from. So I think we'll have a very uh, much better way of, of coming back to you with some, some data points and saying, uh, yeah, we've improved here. But if there are some areas that we still need improvement, we'll come back and be able to actually target which, those. Which, which equates to getting which, the data back to us faster. Getting the back data back quicker to you and able to make quicker decisions around uh, your committee meetings here to how, how we can move forward and what uh, type of process we want to put in place to continue this data quality improvement process. Second question I have is, uh, and I'm hurrying because we have like a minute. Um, well, that's what you think. So, so April is when we can, is the earliest that you project that we're going to be able to start submitting. What is the deadline? When is the, you can't, you have to submit version three no matter what, when you won't accept any legacy? So that deadline has not been determined yet. And a uh, determination on that deadline will not occur until once we know the state is at a point where we are now certified. We don't want to make a deadline where everyone has to submit V3 data to us and we're not even at that point yet. All right, so you're going to collect both legacy and the version three for at least at least a year after that. Correct. Okay. We, we believe that. We've talked to some of the stakeholders and, and their vendors, and, and they're just not ready to. They, they, they're going to start making their changes somewhere around June, July. So they're going to need some time to still okay. implement that point in time. So they've asked us, can we, can we wait from them? We said, yeah, we're not going to turn off that legacy part. We're going to still continue uh, collecting that data in that process. Anything else? 
All right, thanks, guys. We really appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the great work you guys are doing. Okay, in about three seconds, either we're all going to blow up or that clock's just going to shut off and do something <laughs> weird. Wow, it does make noise. Is, is there anybody that knows how to kill it other than me throwing something heavy at it? Uh, it looks like right on top of that table is a reset button. Never mind. Okay. It'll stop on its own. Good. Oh, and it gives right. 90 more minutes. Uh, nice. <laughs> awesome. It's done. Um, so I'm going to, we're going to skip around. We're going to do a couple of things. Um, I asked uh, Derek Jakovich to be here today. I'm going to ask him to step up to the mic real quick. Um, DSHS has recently changed or modified the way it's doing some um, audits of current providers. Um, there's some worksheets they're using and some things like that, some different ways they're looking at some stuff, some different processes. And so um, I asked him to, to stop by and help explain that and um, kind of where it is, what's going on with it, um, and then we'll take a few questions. Um, I anticipate we may bring this back on our agenda as a real agenda item, but um, because of the level of interest and the number of items I heard about this since I got into town Tuesday, I thought, well, let's take advantage of this as much as we can. So, Derek, you got the floor. Thank you. Um, what I want to do is give a little background first. We've been doing provider surveys for a long, long time under our existing authority in the law and rules. Um, and primarily, we've had a provider initial checklist that we've used for new providers, and we've utilized that as well um, when we have done surveys of existing providers. Um, and that uh, checklist has been out there and available on our website, I think, since 2011. Um, what we've been using uh, of late, last May of 14, what we decided to do, um, several things have occurred that have allowed us to be able to do more provider surveys. And we've modified our process a little bit um, so that we can manage that workload across the state and on a consistent basis get in and do those provider surveys statewide. Um, just to give you an idea, we did approximately 189 surveys in, in 14. Uh, we did 291 in FY12, 191 in 13. We've done approximately 63 so far in FY15. So a lot of surveys have been done. This new process is more of a focus survey on the 157 LM 11 little m with provider responsibilities and we've got a new checklist that our staff are using and our plan is um, what this process does is when we have identified a provider that we want to do a survey they receive a letter approximately 30 days out and some information is asked for um, and they kind of do a self-evaluation they provide that to us that allows the provider to prepare and get ready for the survey as well as us to plan and schedule as well. Um, what happens is then we actually, uh, the survey's announced, it's scheduled with you as the provider so that you know when we're coming. You can make arrangements to have the right staff there um, so that hopefully it'll go smoothly and you know what to expect when we uh, come in. Um, some of the things that have happened, uh, one, we finally completed the transition so that we've gotten uh, the provider licensing processing out of our compliance unit branch shop uh, down into the certification uh, group. Uh, the requirements of SB 8 uh, have drastically reduced the number of initials. Before that, we had about 10 initials a month, uh, and that's a lot of work for us. Uh, that has, of course, um, the number of initials now, I think, since the beginning of September has been approximately six. Those have been government related. Uh, and so that workload has dramatically reduced for us. That allows our staff to spend more time doing these surveys. Um, the other thing, of course, part of that is the AOR requirements. Um, the other thing that's happened is the mobile technology piece that's been implemented where the, the staff are using the, the tablets and we've gone electronic with using the checklist uh, and that's uh, made us a lot more efficient as well. So a lot of those factors going into place have allowed us to be more productive. Um, what our plan is, is hopefully by the April newsletter, we're going to do a uh, FAQ at kind of explaining this new focused uh, provider survey. 
and we'll have the checklist available on our website so that anyone will be able to get it and prepare and be ready. Our goal is to get everybody on a approximate three-year survey frequency. Uh, that's kind of what we've already done with the ambulance inspections statewide, and that's our goal uh, to do that for the providers across the state in the, the coming year. We may need to tweak the process some, how this goes, um, but uh, we think uh, this new checklist will be good for us at, and the providers. Um, the requirements aren't new, um, but it'll help us be consistent across the state and how we, how we do these surveys. Another thing I wanted to mention was we really encourage everybody that when you're getting an inspection or a survey, um, you should be given the information and the link for our uh, customer satisfaction survey. We encourage everybody to do that because that's a really good way to give us feedback, good and bad, uh, on the job we're doing. And I want to encourage everybody, if, we, uh, if you have questions, send them into one of the managers, Joe or myself, and we'll try and incorporate those into our FAQ responses that we're going to be working on. That's kind of a broad, high-level overview. So you come out to Shared CMS to do this survey, and out of this Section M, which is a huge section, um, and looking at the checklist, I have issues with, say, six of these things. What happens then? When you say you have issues, in what way? Um, you found deficiencies and you disagree, or? Yeah, so I'm just looking through here. Um, uh, yeah, QA and reports. So I, I tell you how we do it, but I don't have a four-page binder that has it all explained out in, in speak and that kind of stuff. Or it, it, Yeah, you find deficiencies. What happens then? Well, the, the process we've utilized is if we find deficiencies, you will get a deficiency report, and we ask you to respond with using a, a plan of correction back to us to address those deficiencies. If during the survey process um, you have a concern with a particular finding, I would encourage you to talk to that staff and or contact the zone manager um, if you need to address it right there. It's probably the best, most efficient way to tackle it. Then does that become a discipline issue? So I respond to that? Uh, for all these surveys that I've referenced, uh, we've had a handful of initial denials that ultimately the provider did get licensed once they corrected everything. Uh, otherwise, we've been using this deficiency report and plan of correction process, and as far as I know, we have not actually referred anybody to state enforcement at this time. We've just used that. Here's the issue. Please get it corrected and, and working with the provider. Okay, does anybody else on the committee have any questions? And how long has this been going on now? Well, long? we've been doing this, the surveys for a long time, like I mentioned. Yeah. This new kind of more focused checklist, I think that was completed around May of 2014 um, is when we've been trying to utilize it. I know, we just, we just, we just research, re, re, re-licensed, and it was, it was great. It was probably the best process that I've done in, in 20 years. It was, it was quick, it was, we provided the documents, and it was done. We had documentation back. Um, I, I was really impressed with it. Good. I mean, obviously, with a, an initial provider, it's going to be more comprehensive, and we kind of we have the discretion if maybe there's some compliance history in the past, maybe we want to do a true full survey. But if there haven't been any issues, then we're hoping this focus survey will allow us to to actually spend more of our time on compliance activities. I think at one point y'all were so bogged down as we would get the the actual license. Followed by a week later, we get the letter saying when you receive your license. So we got the we got the, the letter first, which was great. Right. So I think right now it's a good process. It allows you to prepare us to plan and prepare. Um, so there hopefully aren't any surprises when we arrive. Derek, I had understood that um, in doing these surveys that you had had some providers that were not very happy with with you coming out and doing surveys. They hadn't seen you all in a long time because you've been busy with other things. Is that fact? Um, I have not heard any issues about the okay. process until I, I wouldn't think last you, week. 
Um, and and the, there's been some comments in our customer survey that actually have been very positive about the process, uh, similar to what was just said. I would think it would be positive. Um, we've been having people from the Houston region coming to our RACs and coming to our county association meetings and giving us all this information and technical assistance and, and having um, specialists around uh, the area more readily um, seems like a positive to me. And so I just wanted to make sure that it was going well. Yeah, I, I think with, with just a number of things coinciding all at once, it's allowed us to allocate more time to doing the sure. compliance activity we wanted to and being more of a resource to you. Did um, We've had our compliance survey. Um, is it across the state or we had, we recently had a meeting and I understood that it was just certain managers had kicked that off already or is everyone kind of It, it is that across now? the state. Um, some zones have probably done a few more than others. That's part of how we're trying to manage this uh, statewide to make sure everyone we hit that three-year target of, of when we're going to visit you. And, and for the inspections, for example, if someone's caught up on their work, someone is, is behind, we'll shift some resources to catch up so that statewide we're hitting that three-year target, and that's what we're going to try and do here. Are, are you going to be, I know the compliance checklist I don't see that on your, I see the initial, the renewal and the site survey. Correct. Is the, that, the you said they're going to be uploading that? Site survey. So the brand new checklist we have not posted yet. We anticipate we're going to do a last check, make sure we don't need to make any revisions. Then we're going to post that and it'll hopefully there'll be the link when we put the FAQ together in the newsletter for April, there'll be a link and, and everyone can get the checklist as well. I'd also like to suggest we had a uh, meeting. We had um, Jaime and we had our uh, local, Sean Wheat came down, and a group of us that had been surveyed or were about to be surveyed, they met with us, and they kind of explained the background of it. They went through the survey. They gave us an example of one that had not gone so well. Uh, that, um, we, had ours, we had that meeting after we had had ours, but I think that that kind of clarity and being able to ask, answer all the questions and go through that checklist with them I think it was helpful. Um, I think it was, there was still a little bit of ambiguity and stuff where some of the stuff you really feel like it's um, the site surveyor's um, interpretation of it, I guess. And so uh, they did clear up a lot of stuff by meeting with us. And we did recommend maybe with the AOR course, that might be a great component to add is going through, this is what to expect with your compliance survey. Okay, that's a good idea. Just to. Thank you. If you don't mind me commenting, that was Fort Bend County that complimented Yes. Okay. <laughs> du du duly noted. Your compliance is okay. Anybody from the audience? So, in full disclosure, this isn't a good cop, bad cop routine because I actually had a long conversation with Derek and Joe. Um, but I just want to make sure that I brought out some things that you could clarify so people would understand. So, um, a person puts in to become a uh, Kleenex ambulance. Uh, that may actually be a name, so it's Apex. That's probably a name. Cool guys. Carpet ambulance. Um, that that initial survey, that initial survey is going to be analogous to this one, correct? The one that we're talking about, because I think there's three things at play here. There's the inspection of your vehicles that was taking semi-regular occurrence. This is, an, this is in addition to or an augmentation of that process. So just because you come out and count Band-Aids and 4 by 4s that is not what we're talking about. We're talking about a survey process related to things like your QA plan, your vehicle maintenance, how do you make sure your people are still certified, you know, and on and on and on, right? So I think that the, so the, the clarity is I know that you've been doing those surveys for quite a long time, but w if you actually break it down, when, when Brian's talking about a survey, Brian, have you been through this process? Or are you talking about your relicensure? Because that's a whole nother piece. I'm so when you, right okay, so relicensure, relicensure is a separate piece. So we need to all make sure that we're talking about apples, oranges, and bananas, right? That's why I said they have to a job they were doing. Right, right. because, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, so you filled out your paperwork, you gave them the changes to your protocol, those kind of things. So, so just for clarity's sake, so that, because I know that in your mind you're clear, but for us, you know, dragging the anvil, we need to make sure we've got, we have the, the renewal of a provider's license and you're considering that a survey of that information, right? Are you talking about the, like your renewal application? Yeah, we, renewal application. 
Is that, are you that's, calling that a survey? That's, that's, what, that's what we have shifted to the certification group under. Okay, so they're just, they're just dotting the I's, Separate crossing the T's. Separate apart from us being on site, looking at your provider operations. Okay, so that was what Brian made reference to. Then I move over and what some of the others are making reference to, at least in the Metroplex, was this survey process where you're coming out and, and actually saying, okay, in 157.11, little m, it's all of these things you should have in place. And before, before now, very rarely did you have to give an example of that after the initial application. For instance, your MCI plan. People could write their MCI plan on a cocktail napkin and it was received as you were going to call people back if they were available and you're going to shoot up a flare and scream for help. So aside from your MCI, I mean, that was acceptable at some point. Um, so I think that the, the fear is that because of the complexities of this current survey process where you have gone in and specifically identified uh, elements that are not scriptive in the law, nor are they scriptive in the rule. You have t done a third step and you've become prescriptive as a result of the rule that was promulgated from the law. So I applaud that. I think a survey process is where we need to go. I, I think that it, it raises the bar. It pushes us towards professionalism. I just think that some of the fear is that uh, when, when, you take, when you say that I have to have a QA plan, I'm pulling this out of the air. When you say I have a QA plan and there's nine elements, the fear is where did those nine elements come from? Are those truly nationally accepted best practices? And shouldn't we put all of that out there so that similar to a CMS compliance plan that, that all of us have to have with regards to billing, we could come up with a standard format compliance plan because in the end we just want to affect patient safety and quality outcomes, right? And so I think that that's where some of the angst is coming from. So I, you and I have already discussed that and I told you that, but um, I wanted to be sure to, to articulate that because, you know, one QA plan doesn't necessarily mirror another QA plan. It's going to be regional, it's going to be size of service, it's going to be medical director involvement. So when you, when you look at that, I know that we have to leave a, a measure of subjective nature in there for the, for, the, for the inspectors so that they can kind of make that flexible to the size of the service and those things. But, but, what the, but best practices, I think, is where people are trying to come up with you know, the fire guys, they've, they've had it on the fire side for years, and, and so there's kind of an accepted format. When we move it into the EMS, I think that was the, the angst. So anyway, I'll just put that out there. Well, and, and in this new survey, I mean, it, it tracks what's in little m. Those are the minimum standards. When you all sign your license application, you've read, understood, know what you're supposed to be doing. And so when we come out, that's what we were looking for, that confirmation that you're meeting the requirements of little m. We know there's going to be some variation how you accomplish that. We understand that. We talk to staff about that. Uh, every scenario is going to be a little bit different how you achieve your compliance. And, and go ahead, Brett, you want to comment? Yeah, the, the other thing the, on the QA plan you mentioned specifically, uh, number three in our. You have to get really close. Uh, uh, you mentioned QA plan specifically. The rule spells out seven items that a QA plan of each provider has to have and address. Preventive maintenance, readiness inspections, patient care review. That's three of those seven things that you have to have. Uh, drug storage. So these are simple things that everybody knows has, has been given notice through through the rule. Sure, but you, excuse me. Um, you have to have those. But who says is my plan correct or incorrect? I think is where sometimes we run into a problem. Uh, I do applaud recently though we have. In the past, when I'd ask for a rule interpretation, like I'd say, what is an out of service ambulance? How do I mark that? I would get a copy of the rule and sent back to me. Well, I read that. I'm trying to do the right thing. And so recently, um, at least in our area, I've gotten better responses, more than just a copy of the rule that I already had access to. When we ask you those things, of course, we're looking for the correct thing. And when the problem, like with some of like the readiness plans and stuff is what works for me where I have fleet within my city might not work for a system that has two ambulances and doesn't have fleet, you know, so is a plan that says if it's broke, we send it to the shop. Is that acceptable? Or, you know, like, um, I guess maybe some examples of what you expect in these might also help us also because we want to be compliant. We just need to, you know, find out what's going to meet your requirements. And, and one, of the, one of the things we've talked about is especially now when we're looking at the, at the rules, um, a lot of my perspective comes from the health facility side because we're doing the state federal survey so I'm familiar with that process and just an example 
in, in the hospital rules, a lot of times we require the facility to have a policy that addresses X, mm -hmm. and there are certain components of it, but we let the facility figure out how you're going to meet that. And as we yes. work on these rules, I want to have a similar approach <coughs> with the rules. These are the minimum standards that you need to have, but you need to figure out how you're going to meet it, and then you show us when we come in. Okay. That's what I'm hoping for. It, and by the quietness of the room, and maybe it's the lateness of the hour or the ever-growing hypoglycemia that is occurring, but um, this room is infinitely quieter than the hallway discussions have been, and I think the other thing that folks are hedging around saying or nobody's willing to come up to say for whatever reason um, is that for the last 14 years of my involvement of going around the state and trying to do rule revisions and talk about issues and do those type of things like that, um, the thing we always hear is the rules are interpreted differently in different regions and by different inspectors in the same region. And the big concern I've heard about this, because the survey tool does says a, a QA plan has to have these nine things, but it doesn't tell, it does not prescribe exactly what those nine things are. And to, I think to drill into Heidi's point a little bit, I think one of the concerns, and maybe you can address this in that article, one of the concerns of the, of the stakeholders is th that what meets QA plan appropriateness in, in the San Antonio region may not in the DFW region or what meets that in Lubbock for Inspector A may not meet that in Lubbock for Inspector B. And that is, that is a large concern of this. And, and I'll tell you, I think, and, and I'm going to say what everybody else has said, I, th I think we're long overdue for this. Um, it's good that you got that we've gotten you to a place where you're free to start regulating all of us and start to really start looking at us. Um, but but there are years and years of tough experiences where we only sh saw you when you showed up to kick open the door and say you guys screwed up and here's how bad you've been and here's how much damage we're going to do to you as a result of it. And there's a lot of gun shyness because of issues we've had in that. And so. It, it, I think one of the things that is is concerned to folks is e either potential overreach or uh, or differences in interpretation, which I think goes back to what Ryan was trying to mention is as we continue to refine this, as you continue to do more of these, it, it is is looking back to the stakeholders in the state, the agencies that you're regulating and saying, what are the best practices for preventative maintenance? What are the industry best practices for a QA plan? What are the industry best practices for review and run reports, protocol revision, the, the things that are in little m, so that we can start to put a little more finite definition on that. It's always going to be different agency to agency, um, but th there is just a growing fear that through this process that th the, the differences in interpretation from person to person may, may make shirts EMS okay, but New Braunfels Fire Department up a creek. So, sorry, New Braunfels, if you're watching. <laughs> in all my programs, consistency of the compliance staff across this big state is, is an ongoing challenge yeah. for us, no doubt about it. Um, but I think using this tool, it's going to be a very good start for our staff to be trained and to be consistent. And if you think someone's off, off base, you need to talk to that specialist and or call their manager. I mean, I encourage everybody to do that, to say, hey, we think we've met this rule. You don't think we are. Let's talk about it and, and try and address it right there. A lot of times, and I don't know if we have it in the rules yet, uh, if we find a deficiency, we typically ask someone for a plan of correction back if you're still disagreeing about a particular deficiency, there's a separate rebuttal process that can be utilized, and I'd like to see that in our uh, rules as well because it's worked really well for years on the, on the health, health facility side. But we need to have good communication with you all. If you think we're way off base, you need to say, hey, and, and you know, when we're finding something, that's your opportunity to say, hey, we have that documentation. We think we met this minimum standard rule. If you've implemented best practices, that's not in our rules. Our, you know, so the rules are the minimum standards we're going to hold you accountable for. Fern, did you want to say something? I know she stepped well, up to the mic. Just to clarify a couple of things, and respectfully, um, the, the survey process has changed over the years. And at one time, there were quite a few best practices identified on there. 
And because of, of the, uh, the subjectivity and, and, and the differences of opinion, uh, we, we, I think we did a fairly good job of removing those best practices and just referring it to rule. Um, and, and I hope, I hope every, each and every licensed provider has their own QA plan. What, what gets suspicious is when you go get the one off the bookshelf that you can buy at the bookstore and er everybody has the same one. Not everybody, I, I don't want to be categorical. Uh, but you see a number of, of uh, QA plans that are out there that, that you're telling us that you're doing these things and we're all we're asking for is documentation and, and there's none there, then, then that's just, that just makes you ask the next question. You know what's being done so I, I hope those programs are unique uh, and I think all we're asking for is is to validate that, that you're doing what you're telling us and and like Derek uh, uh, stated I want to reiterate if, if ever if ever uh, any provider feels that, that they're not being uh, dealt a fair hand they may feel that way but if, if you really think that's not happening uh, let me know. Let, let, let the managers know. We want to address those issues at, at that level. And, and we, we always want to be consistent and we want to be uh, equitable in what we do and how we do it. Well, and I think that's the take home message. It, it, I mean, I think you guys know this. I'm probably not going to share anything new with you, but out of the 100, 150 people you see here every quarter, I don't think there's a one of us that has a problem telling you if we're thinking you're screwing up. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not sure that same level of comfort is there with the other 700 providers, leaders, and and when the cops show it, they send you a letter saying we're coming to look at you, and they show up to look at you. Um, not everybody's comfortable questioning the cops, so um, maybe even having that in the article and a part of that being the introductory spiel that the folks give when they come through the door, which I'm sure a lot of them do. Uh, you know, I mean, they understand they're not coming into the most comfortable environment either. <laughs> Everybody's sitting up straight, man. So. Um, it, 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 there's just a lot to this, you know. I, I mean, it, like I said, I think it's a good thing. I think we'll get through it. I think I think we'll be better for it. Um, I just think the more we share and the more we lean upon each other to make it better, I think I think the better off we'll be. So, anything else Appreciate for the police? We're not, we're not the health police. <laughs> <laughs> and you're from Fort Bend. <laughs> what a great job we're doing. That's from Fort Bend. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's knocking on your door now, Brian. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, Derek. I appreciate you coming out and spending the time to talk about this today. We may have more. Just to, We'll see how the topic bubbles up. But um, I think we have a couple updates left to do. I'm going to have Joe Palfini make his way to the front and Sam Vance make his way to the front. Joe is the new state EMTF coordinator. Um, Victor Wells has moved on and took a promotion at Strack to do some other things. And we brought Joe in off the, off the bench. You may remember Joe from his, from his previous life as hospital preparedness guy and disaster dude extraordinaire. Um, but now he's the state EMTF coordinator here to give us a quick update. And it will be quick. My upper GI tract says it needs to be. Uh, first of all, you already mentioned Victor. Uh, I think it's important that we just recognize that Victor, he moved on to some uh, different responsibilities within STRAC, uh, but he's still very active in the EMTF program. He's done some great things over the last couple of years, brought us to where we are. So uh, just thank Victor for his service. Uh, the big, I have two uh, updates that are uh, important enough to talk about at this time. Um, first of all, our ASM and MIS courses uh, for this year have been published. Um, those courses are uh, going to be conducted. Uh, the, the ambulance staging manager initial course is going to be the first and second of April in College Station, and uh, the medical incident support team course update, or I'm sorry, initial course is going to be conducted uh, the 29th and 30th of April in Austin. Uh, both of those courses are available for enrollment uh, through the regional EMTF coordinators. Uh, so. Anyone interested can get in touch with them. Uh, and then any folks that have already been to courses, the updates are scheduled at the end of May in Bastrop, and the registration process is the same. And the only other announcement that uh, we'd like to make is the fact that uh, the state EMTF program uh, is pursuing some uh, legislative funding this year uh, to kind of augment and uh, support the current federal funding that we're getting for the program, which we obviously know is dwindling. It's been dwindling for years. 
uh, it's going to provide that stable and permanent uh, resource that we need to keep the program going. Uh, it's really in the infancy stages right now, uh, but we will be bringing more uh, information to this group and uh, over all of the uh, electronic media that many folks are subscribed to. So we just uh, ask for everyone's support in that process uh, as it continues. I think it's going to be a, a good thing for the state of Texas. And that's all I have unless you have questions, sir. Anything for Joe? All right, thanks, man. Sam. Well, since it is late, um, I can, uh, what I have is a report on the 2013-14 uh, National EMS Reassessment, which would take about 10 to 15 minutes, so I can defer that to May, if okay. you'd like. You, you all right doing that till May? Yeah, I'm okay with that, okay. if y'all are okay with that. Yeah, I think we are. If not, I've, we can we can sit here for the next 15 minutes, if you like. Well, our audience is dwindling fast. I, I see that. <laughs> I see that. No, it's okay. It, it can be deferred till May. All right. I'm sorry about that, man. We tried That's to get there right. quick, but some if of these you things. Learned by now. I'm I'm pretty easy going. I so. know you are, Sam. I appreciate yeah, that. All right. Thank you. Um, last thing I have under public comment um, is I'd like to talk about one other piece of legislation that's been filed. Um, it's House Bill 1547. I just want to talk about that at the EMS committee and probably get in trouble from DSHS for talking about it, but. Um, about a year to 18 months ago during our committee meeting and a couple of other committee meetings um, it came up about what happens to extraordinary emergency funds if they're not spent for extraordinary emergencies and um, it was discovered that those get lopped in with the rest of the dollars for uncompensated trauma care and paid out to the hospitals and there were a number of folks in various open discussions and we may have even made it an agenda item at one point during those meetings um, that expressed some frustration that that money wasn't staying available for extraordinary emergencies or to help continue to grow the EMS system even though they are available to hospitals and EMS it's not an EMS only fund um, and so um, it, there's a house bill out there house bill 1547 that grew out of those discussions um, that was put forward by by a group here in Texas um, that would essentially say that if those E funds are not spent in any fiscal year, they would be um, allowed to grow to a maximum of $2 million in the E fund. And if the end of a fiscal year there were more than $2 million left in that fund, that anything over $2 million gets swept out and added to the local project grants for the next year. It does not replace, it adds so that we could potentially start growing the local project grant to something larger than one and a quarter million dollars a year. Um, so if you see that, it has the um, reference of emergency medical services and trauma funding and it doesn't read exceptionally clear and some folks may think that we're trying that somebody's trying to do something with the trauma dollars or the driver responsibility bill it's not in the least it's merely the discussions that were made here um, about men it would be nice if we could um, there's some folks who got together and, and sought some help to try to make that happen so if you see that if you hear people talking about it there's nothing sinister about it um, it's merely to clean up the language in the original bill that established the Extraordinary Emergency Fund. Um, because of the way it was written, you can read it either way, and, and the legal folks have interpreted that it has to be swept and go to uncompensated trauma care, and we're just trying to keep it in in the E-Fund longer, let the E-Fund be bigger, and then use anything left over to go to the local project grants. So, Mr. Chairman, I would it, assume that what you're doing right now is just telling us to go out and look at uh, Absolutely. 1547, you're not pushing the bill? Or not at all. I don't bill, care one way or the other. Educational process. Educational <laughs> process about what it means so that people will understand what it says. Yep. Anything else? Uh, George Reston, thank you. Okay. Anything else for the good of the order? All right. Y'all have a great day. Thanks for hanging out. Yeah, <laughs>